Heavenly Father, we thank you for the opportunity that Dale preached for us. You know, we tried to get Beth to get the pastor to come in and sub for Pastor Peter and not have the same person every week, but we know that you always know what's best, and you worked it out for him to be with us for three straight weeks and carry that theme in his sermon about prayer, and we needed that. We ask again for you to touch each one of us so we would see clearly and recognize how awesome you are. That we will continue in prayer to lift you up, to glorify you. Recognize your Holy Spirit and to rely on you and trust in your power, your plan, and your purpose. We ask that you use each person here. And you've already used people here. You've pulled us in. People for you, Lord. Again, we ask that you refresh each person. We will continue to pursue you as all that we do. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Good morning. And welcome to a normal Sunday <laughs> here at this wonderful church. And again, some of you know that Peter is away on sabbatical. Mm. He'll be gone for a month. And every week we have a different person presenting a message. And there's a list in the back of the room on the wall that's registered. And today it's part three of my three-part series. <coughs> Remember I told you that most everything that I've talked about has been taken from this book, and this is a really good book. I think you would enjoy looking through this if you have the opportunity. So several things I want you to keep in mind while we're discussing this this morning. I want you to remember where Paul is when he was writing this, where he was. He was very encouraging, very positive in his writing and in his message to the people in Ephesus. And he wrote this from prison. And I think that most of us, you and I would say, that it would be hard for us to write such a positive message to people while we were in such a bad situation like he was in prison there. And that's what it looked like. Just rock and dirt, cold, damp, wet, all those things. So I want you to keep in the back of your mind that Paul, his focus was not on his current problem, but his focus was on what God wanted. And the first part of the message, which was two weeks ago, we talked about a few specific things, and I want to summarize those. First of all, we pray to God the Father, and that's critical. We're not asked to pray to Mother Tree, or whatever. We are praying to God the Father in heaven. And that's the person that we pray to. And we have to recognize that I am a Christian. And I have to recognize that prayer means that I can't do things by myself. I realize that. It means that I must be wholly dependent upon God. So when we understand that, we understand how that works, how prayer works, what the purpose is, then most of the time, Paul <coughs> emphasizes here that it shows that we are dependent 100% upon God for whatever the situation is. And then also that prayer is spiritual. And that's very important, that spiritual part of our lives. It's the hub. We talked about the hub, if you remember, and that's critical that we understand that. Prayer is not, oh, church says we need to pray, so I'll just pray this little thing and be done. No, it is the center. It's critical, an important part of our Christian lives. And some people have that spiritual gift of prayer, they are so amazing at that, really deep in prayer, that interaction they have with God. 
And God doesn't expect us all to be like that. If you don't have that spiritual gift of prayer, it means you don't have it. But God is not saying only some, only a few people must pray. God says that all of us need to pray. So be careful not to make comparison because some people, I just look at them and go, oh my gosh, they're so amazing at prayer. You know, in traditional churches, how elaborate it can be, how gracious the Holy Father is, and blah, 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 all those fancy things they say, and we look at them in awe, and, and they tend to go on and on sometimes, but it can be beautiful. And sometimes it feels like it's not real. That prayer is like too much of a show. But the point of all of this is that every one of you, if you have taken Christ into your heart, he's part of your life, then prayer needs to be the hub, the key. And I shared that with you that I think prayer is not my top skill. I struggle with it sometimes. And it just means that it's not automatic. It's not an automatic habit of mine. So, you know, I start my prayer. What do I want to say? Um, you know, it's just not a natural thing. And I see God working in my life. But prayer is something I still work on. You have to understand that, you know, I'm not preaching that Dale understands all this. I'm growing just like you are. We're growing together. In the passage that we looked at, that the author used, was Ephesians 1. And Paul is saying, I haven't stopped thinking about you. I pray for you constantly. God the Father, the Lord Jesus Christ, who has given you the spiritual wisdom. Grow in your knowledge of God. And that is so important to understand and realize that Paul, he's in prison and he's praying for himself? No, not at all. He's praying for you, the people in Ephesus at the time. And to me, that's kind of a, what do you call that? A paradigm shift. I know that so many of us pray for ourselves. I need a job. I want to have Christian friends. I want a new car. I want good grades in school. I want, I want, I want. But Paul, he is in prison here. And if I was in prison, I'm telling God, get me out of here. That's what I'd be praying. But not Paul. He doesn't say that. He is praying for the people. And that's part of our prayer life, too. I think many of us lack that part. We're not really fully in prayer for others like Paul was here, meaning that we pray for spiritual wisdom and understanding about him so that we can grow more about him. And these things are emphasized. And I did mention two weeks ago, I believe, this part. Knowledge, knowledge of God. It doesn't mean that you have to go to seminary, you have to study. It's not this kind of knowledge. It's an understanding of the Bible and knowing what's in the Bible. Maybe you don't know. No one knows the entire Bible. There's just so much within it. And there's always new information to be learned. When you learn information, it is by continually growing in your knowledge of what the Bible says. It doesn't change. It doesn't waver. It can't. Parts of it can't be deleted. That's not growing your knowledge of God. Growing your knowledge of God is realizing things. How holy, how magnificent God truly is. And you get it from the Bible. Through sermons, through Bible study, through talking with other Christians and friends. That's how you learn more about God. And again, Paul is praying for those people of Ephesus. Realize that you have confident hope, and that's critical, that confident hope. Because if you waver, if you doubt, then your relationship with God shows you not, you're not fully understanding <coughs> You have to have confident hope in that what you learn about God is deep-rooted. 
and there are no doubts. You are saved. You will go to heaven. You will grow in God. You have sin. You need to remove that. There is no doubt that finger crossed. Oh, I hope, I hope I get to heaven. There is not that kind of hope. If you've accepted Jesus Christ, you will get there. And you have his support and power while you're here on earth. from the dead. And Jesus is now is sitting on the right hand of the Father. He controls the kingdom. He controls the world here and our future in heaven. So you and I have a very powerful God. And we have access to him through Jesus Christ. He raised Jesus from the dead. Jesus is seated at the right hand. Jesus right now has power and authority in this world and also in the future world. Maybe you say, but you know what? I thought Satan was in control of the earth. Yeah, God gave that. Do you see what I said? God allowed that. But who is actually in charge? It's Jesus. Yes, Satan is here among us on earth only because God allowed it. How and why? That's a whole nother sermon. But he is still in charge, even though Satan is here on earth trying to mess up our lives. Did I say something wrong or something funny? I think maybe this, go to the next one. The next one. The next one. This, that's what I was looking for. This was last week's summary, the five parts. Paul taught us and about prayer. He said there are five things. You need to stay focused. That means that we need to be focused to learn and to see about God. See who he is. And during our prayer time, we need to reflect what we know. Doesn't mean we have all the right answers. That's part of growing. Maybe one person didn't realize that God is all knowing. They didn't know that. And they say, you know, thank you, God, for giving us Jesus Christ. And then another person in their pray prayer might say, thank you, God, for being so all knowing. From the past to the present to the future, he knows everything. So through our prayers, we take different things from each other. And then pray for hope. Prayer that people around you are influencing. Understand that. That hope in God is a permanent thing. Strength. And it's reliable. It's not the kind of cross your finger hope. It's that confident hope. When people ask me, are you sure you're going to go to heaven? I say, yeah. Yeah. There is no doubt, there is no doubt, but I heard this or I heard that, and I know some churches think that you can miss heaven because you don't do all these specific things, and other people say, well, the Bible says I can't because I have this problem, and yada yada. Those are the ones who messed up, not me. Scripture says you have Jesus Christ in your heart then you have eternal life. How clear can that be? It's not cross your fingers, I really hope this happens, or I'm gonna to go to hell. It's not. Why live in uncertainty like that when the scripture right here is very clear? But we have to do our part, that's the problem. Some people take Jesus into their heart and think, oh, I'm going to heaven, it's all good, and they sit back and do nothing, they don't grow in knowledge, and that is the problem. You're not growing in the Lord. You're not wanting to change your life. You're not wanting to be with other Christians. You're not wanting to change your lifestyle. 
if you don't make any changes and don't try to pursue Jesus Christ, then did you actually take him into your heart? I mean, that doesn't make sense. Because if you really have accepted him into your heart, then you should want to change. Some people just take him into their heart and immediately they're like a changed person. And people say, who are you? You're so different. And some people take Jesus Christ into their heart and they seem just the same. But in their minds, they may be learning. It's okay. That's okay. We all have different journeys. But scripture is very clear. Help me remember where it is. Arnie, where is that verse that says... If you grow, oh, what is it? If you grow and you don't have Jesus in your heart, something, what is that verse? Do you know? Where is it? What's the scripture? What's the verse? The verse says you must grow in Romans. It's Romans, it says this. Romans. What is it? I thought maybe he would know because he actually quoted it to me before. But in scripture it says that if I am not growing, then I'm not really listening. You can't accept Christ and then have no change within your life. It's impossible. If Jesus Christ is in your heart, you will want to change to follow him. I got off point there, but I apologize. Pray for riches. So when you accept Christ, you change your life for him, meaning that you are becoming adopted by him. So everything that he has, he is giving to you. You inherit it. But scripture also says that when you make that connection with God, you become his sons and daughters. So really it works for both ways. You're getting God and God's getting me. He wants us to become his children. He really wants that. And we receive the blessings when we become his. So when we pray, that should be our focus, that other people realize that they need to know him and how they can learn is through you and me, through our example. Power means that we must understand that God is powerful. Now the problem is we pray and we expect to see an immediate answer. The problems, the stress, all those things just go away just like that. And that's not the truth that we see in scripture. He guarantees that we will have suffering throughout our life. He guarantees that. But he also guarantees that we will have blessings too. We are human nature. We have human nature. And we kind of focus on the problems. God didn't solve my problems. I mean, God isn't powerful. He can't fix this. That is not what the Bible says. It says you accept him, you change your life. It never said your life would be easy and smooth. It never said that. You see pastors, you see teachers, you see people comment. And they're, oh, I'm supposed to change my life, and then it's supposed to be easy. But that is not true. It's a mesh of, of blessings, and your life will improve and change. But suffering and frustration, frustration is guaranteed. Jesus himself suffered. That is life. But how we get through it by trusting in him is where the power comes from. Realizing that what we're doing now, that my life on earth is powerful. It's important because he controls me now. He is using me and using you and you and you and all these different people in different ways that we could have never imagined. And often people come up to me and said, I remember you said something five or six years ago. And I'm like, oh, I said that? But that really impacted me, and that comment changed my life. And I don't even remember saying it. But God used us in that way. That person's life changed simply because I made a comment. Wow. But I'm not, you know... I'm not impacting everyone. That's not my job. That's God's power. And it doesn't matter what your life is, your background, your history, what you've done. So what? Jesus Christ is powerful. 
and he can change you and me. No matter what we face, we can change and be a better Christian and a better follower of his. And lastly, love. All of us are looking for love all the time. We want to be accepted. We want to be loved. And honestly, quite often, Jesus' love, when you read about that, and you believe in that, people say, yeah, that's great, but I'm still lonely. I don't feel like I have any friends. I don't feel like... That's kind of a twisted. My love... And the understanding of what Jesus has done right here on the cross, that was love. To understand that, what he did, and then I can go to heaven and be with him. How many of you do that for me? How many of you would do that for me? I probably wouldn't do it for you either, die on the cross. But he did. Knowing what a jerk I was, knowing, <laughs> affirming that, but he still did that for me, knowing that I would continue to mess up. Wow, that is love. And that love is supposed to radiate from us right here within this church. It's supposed to be all around us because we're praying for each other and not just praying for ourselves. God, I hate that person. Why that person keep coming? I don't want to get rid of them. Please don't make me sit next to that person. No, no, no. Is that love? If we show love to all people, regardless, then people will see that. And this will be considered a loving church. And that love comes from God. And it comes from the hearts and minds. Remember that picture I showed you that last week with the heart and the brain and how it all came together at the bottom? So if you grow in knowledge of God, through Bible study, sermons, learning yourself, whatever, you grow in your knowledge, that your heart will come to realize people will contact you, people will visit, and then you realize they're Christians too, and all of that will come together and make a strong rooted system of Christians. And it would make this church and me personally become stronger Christians and we would think of others. So what do you do with all of this? Now I want to explain. Go out and do it. Go ahead and do it. You're intelligent people. We have some college graduates. Just what do you do? Most of us would continue to fail because we are still lacking something. What is missing? We have it, we actually have it. But we don't use the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit's job is to teach, to educate, to train, to convict to reach out to each one of us. That's the job of the Holy Spirit. So you and I, through prayer, through relationships, through understanding what God is hearing, we need to listen to the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit wants us to grow, but quite often we just push it to the side. We ignore it. We ignore things that are made to help us, help us to grow. Because the Holy Spirit knows all things. And it will teach you and me. But it's through interactions. It's through your prayer life about others. Thinking of those outside of ourselves. And what God really wants. What God has proclaimed. That's more important than me, 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 me. But is it wrong to pray about your health? No, it's not. We can do that. We can pray about our health. Is it wrong to pray about getting a job? No, we can do that. But if I'm sitting back there for one year and I'm putting this down on a prayer list and a prayer request, 99% of the time it's I'm sick, I have a doctor's appointment, or I need a job. That's it. 
1%, sometimes, oh, I need prayer for other people who don't know Christ. That does pop up occasionally, but it's rare. Never once do you say, pray for me, bugs infest, put me in jail. Never once did Paul say, pray for me, I'm in a bug infested jail, I need a lawyer, why did God put me in here? I'm so confused with this whole situation. It's a waste of my time, this preaching about him. I should just go back to killing Christians like I did before. Not once did he do that. He said, you people in Ephesus, wake up. What are you doing? Wake up. You don't realize the power of God. You're not focused on growing in him. You're not focused on your prayer life for others. You're not focused on his wisdom, his kingdom, what he can do for your life. You're just focused on yourselves. Well, I'm better than him. Oh, these little clicks form. That is not why we have different churches. So we can say, oh, I'm in a better church than that, than one in that city. We are here to love each other. So this morning, to continue with the theme, this crazy morning, I want you to do something different. You know, to go back to the previous slide. I want you to make yourself comfortable. You can move the chairs around, whatever works. And the idea would be to have a big circle, but it would take too long to do that. But I want all of us as part of the Deaf Fellowship, as part of this church, to just throw out different prayers related to this. If you don't understand what he's asked you to do, that's fine. We're gonna be learning from each other in this process. I want us to learn through practice and expressing what Paul is saying here. Ephesians chapter 1 in your Bible. If you want to look at Ephesians, it might help you remember some of those verses that Paul has said. Ephesians chapter 1. Look at that if you would like to get some ideas. And I know it's a little confusing. You look confused. <laughs> it's okay. It's good. God will unconfuse us as we go through this process. So I will start, and there is no right or wrong way to do this, but I'm hoping that you will feel like a little less confused and see the Holy Spirit and use that to do it. And if you see somebody else signing something and they're struggling, you can help with clarification if we're talking about these five areas. So I'm going to start. I'm going to open it up by saying, Father in heaven, thank you. For this church. Why are we here? Because of your great vision, how you connect us to you through Jesus Christ. So on this morning, we're doing something different, Lord, in our prayer. And we're not doing it just to be different. We want to learn what we've been talking about for the last few weeks in Ephesians and how to pray more outward. For you. It is about you. Praying for other people, praying for each other. I'm asking you to teach us now. To practice, it will be a little awkward and we might make mistakes, but we ask that you show us how you want us to pray for each other and pray for the world out there so that we can grow and know you more and grow in our love for each other, and grow in our understanding of how powerful you are, God. I lift this all up to you. I trust that you will lead us this morning how you see fit. You are an example for us, and it's in Jesus' name. I'm not gonna actually close the prayer because I'm gonna turn it over to you. You can just stand up where you are, or you can come to the front, and let's see what the Holy Spirit teaches us this morning. So let's open. I had a friend who I was
was with her one week last week, and I was taken aback when she was talking about, I haven't seen this friend from a long time, it was a college friend, and her husband committed suicide, and she was saying all the things she had been through. Her son committed suicide. Her son-in-law was in an accident and died. Her father passed away. I mean, all these things happened. You know what she did? She kept going. She kept saying, God is good, and she moved on. And I was looking at her, and I thought, wow, that's a real Christian. So I would like to pray for her. She's a wonderful person, and what an example of his child. So prayers for her. That's an example. Just watching that, I don't know who that person was, but it helps us to see how, how that testimony, how that helps you and me. Anyone want to comment on how that helps us? Come on up. What did you want to say? Was the Holy Spirit. Some of you were like, wow. Why would you say wow to that? Because it's beautiful? Because not many people in that situation, all those things happen to them? They would maybe blame God. It's the opposite of what we would expect a person to do, right? And many times Christians that face those kind of situations, all those things that happen, they tend to feel like, I'm wasting my time pursuing God. Look what's happening to me. But again, that is because the person doesn't understand that God did not say life would be this beautiful blossoming flower. That's not what he said. It would just be beautiful all the time. You will have problems too. Bugs can infest. Lots of things can happen. But we continue to grow again and again, just like Jesus. So that testimony, we can survive. It's telling us through Jesus Christ. Did you want to say something else, Jackie, related to that? If her husband or her son had continued to live, then things still could have been messed up. But God didn't want them to suffer. They were suffering. And that's difficult to understand, too. But God is in control. Why did this happen to them? We are questioning that because we don't understand it. But he is still in control. And that's what the last part of that says. The fourth one. God is still powerful. Even though people do things that just destroy our hearts. 
Anyone else want to share something? God has done a lot. The frustration sometimes. You know, all my life I felt frustrated. You know, I had bad experiences. I've had wonderful times too. There's been deaths, just so many things, a lot of suffering, but still, you know, you keep going no matter what. And God has been with me the whole way. God is always there for us. I mean, God is good. Ten years ago, my grandmother, who was a Christian, always talked to me and told me how important the church was. And I thought about that, and later on, after she passed away, then later Arnie said to me, why don't you come to church? And so I decided to come to church. And I agree, yes, God is good. <laughs> God used you. God used you, Arnie. Through the Holy Spirit, prompted you to prompt her. I just said, I get depressed, I have bad anxiety, and Arnie just said, maybe come to church. And we're here, and the love and support is here. So thank you, Arnie. You allow the Holy Spirit to work through you. Christians should help others. They should encourage others to come. I sat down before with Peter, right? Are you saved or have you just talked about it? You're still talking about it. Well, good, good. You need to schedule more time. Yeah, Peter will be back and then you can work that out. But God went through Arnie. Really, if we go back, to the grandmother. The grandmother gave you that thought, and then God used Arnie and the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit connects all of us. Through the Holy Spirit, we come to know what you need, what you need, what you need. All those connections happen. And now she's here and wants to consider being saved and wants that life change. So thank you for sharing that. There's someone over here. Yeah how God used the grandmother to start that originally and then worked in that way. Yes, Bob. I'm just curious. If you spread that love out, then more people would be open later to God? Is that what you're saying? They should be, yeah. How people perceive us, how they know God, is through our love. But the problem is that so many times we obviously reject other people. And that's happened at Christians have done that. We all make many mistakes, but even non-Christians do that too. It's not just us, but it's really important that we are careful on how we shun other people, push them away. Because Jesus did say, if you're against God, then you're out. That's it. You're insulting the pharaohs. But Jesus said, that prostitute, people back away from that, no. Pursue her, walk with her. People were like, no, no, you can't. I don't want to associate with a prostitute. You and I would do the same thing, probably. If there was a line of prostitutes, drag queens, or whatever, they all came in, people would go, okay. What's Dale gonna do now with these people right here? This church is for perfect people? No, it's not. This church, people who want to come and seek God, that's what it's here for. And how by our expanding, or having empty seats, people sit in those empty seats and everybody's just looking at them, no, who wants it in here? Wow, what are they doing here? Is that love? No, it's not. Sit down beside them, talk to them, well, what's your name? And they have that exchange. 
that is how God loves us. It's awesome. At the same time, God does have rules, like a guidebook. It's not like I can continue to do these things and be involved in sin and then say it's okay. The scripture is our guidebook, and we have to understand what scripture says, that we need to love all people, and we as Christians also need to pursue scripture. It doesn't bend to help my preferred way of doing something. Okay, any others want to share? For each of us here at this church, we need to continue to grow. We need to continue to go in Jesus Christ. No matter what we're going through, we come to church, or especially for me, like the small group, my Bible study group, when we get together. My desire is to see everyone within this church get involved in some kind of Bible study group or a Sunday school class, just a small group to get involved with and really grow so much with those connections with God through those small groups, and I think that's key. And from there, then we can go out and show the world his love. We can do that. And I just think so many people are lonely, so this small Bible study group or a Sunday school class can really support and help us make those connections with each other, which makes us more connected to God and to others in the community by showing his love. And I know, and I'm sure, you know, Peter's prayer is also that we would continue to grow in Christ. I'm guaranteed that's always part of Peter's prayer. But he can't make it happen. We have to take it upon ourselves. Like Paul said, we have to realize that I am here because God is in control, because God is loving, because God is powerful. Because God wants me to know him. He really wants me to feel confident in that hope that whatever happens to me, I have a place in heaven. I am his child. So I'm not going to minimize him. I have access to him no matter what I'm going through, whether it be with work, with family, something at home, whatever. Yes. I have pain, yes. I get frustrated. I have a group that supports me and I can talk to them about it. Some of them are very supportive of me. And sometimes I feel like, oh, you need to stop because they throw things at me because they're learning a lot. And I'm thinking, what about yourself? What about you? Then you have to think about it. That's what Jesus' family does. We help each other. Sometimes it's hard for us to realize that I don't follow my own preaching. I'm not following what scripture says. I overlook it. That's a human thing. But Christians can understand each other in that way. The message to pray for the Holy Spirit to really come upon us fresh, fall upon us fresh, and I think that so many of us, you know, attend, have attended church for many years. Some grew up within the church. They've attended their entire lives. And sometimes we just allow things to become routine and rote. Or sometimes we serve for a long time and things just become old. Just ask for the Holy Spirit to really refresh anew in each of us that new way of touching our heart, that new desire to serve him, to pursue him. Right? You know, and sometimes people say, my spiritual gift, I, mean, I don't know what it is, I don't know what I'm doing. One person did say to me, I'm a teacher, but I can't really teach. I said to that person, your spiritual gift for teaching, it doesn't mean that you have to stand up here and have a bunch of people looking at you. That is one kind of teaching, that's true. But it also can mean exactly what Arnie did. He taught one person, he taught Ivy, that she needed to come to church. He knew the scripture and he taught her. He had that contact, teaching her some part of that. 
is not standing in front and having lots of people watching necessarily, but he taught her that part of scripture was important in his way. And that is God. He can use each one of you in different ways. And it can work out. But we have to take a step out. Some people are visual like me. They stand up in front. I'm fine with that. But some of you would just be petrified to do this. And that's fine. But that doesn't mean you can't do anything for God. We just shared all of this. In the one book, one good point they made was that quite often as we get older, my time is coming to an end. I've worked many years, so I'm just going to back out and let the youth or the younger people take over. And they ask, you know, what are you doing now? Well, you know, um, what do you think Paul did in jail? Did he just sit and do nothing? No. He wrote letters encouraging people. He prayed for other people, other Christians. And that's what we can do. If you have reached a point in your life where you think you can't do, you can't serve like you used to anymore, there are still mm. countless things that you can do. My mother, I'm so blessed my mother has this church in Ohio. Before that church contacted her, she would stay home a lot. She would go out, not too often, she would always say she was tired. Now, she doesn't miss church on Sundays and Wednesdays. And I'm thinking, she's a lot of trouble for her. She has trouble getting around. She has pain. She's in a wheelchair. She has sleep slot. She takes a lot of medication for pain. But church, oh my word, she's up and ready. And her influence on that church is amazing. She's 85 years old. But her radiance, her love for those people, she loved Jesus, and right now, I used to look at her and just roll my eyes like many of you kids do, <laughs> that thing your parents do. But my mother would just sit there, and she says, oh my Lord Jesus, and I'd be going, oh my gosh. <laughs> in restaurants, talking in the car, she starts six breaks out in song, and her voice, you know, I'm signing, and people don't know my mother is deaf, hard of hearing, but I just go, oh my word. And now I look forward to this. <laughs> mother doesn't know that, but I look forward to this. And I videotape her, because she's gonna be gone someday, and I am gonna miss that. Because she just shows her love for Jesus Christ. And it's so spontaneous, whether she's in a church circle, they call her church mom. <laughs> She's the oldest person in that church. And they just are amazed that she can come. Someone, you know, you have pain, come to church. You're no different. Oh, I'm gonna stop this for now, sorry. But anyway, the point is, God has before you something that you can outwardly show. Think outwardly your own family, your own friends. Maybe there was somebody that came, and you don't know if they've accepted Christ, that has been going around and around and all that is going. Pray. Help that person to know Jesus. Right now, maybe they just don't understand fully. Help that person to grow. Pray for that. Pray that they recognize that God is in control of all things. It's not working, you think? Help them to see God is, that God can help them. But pray outwardly for people instead of just gossiping and criticizing people. And I know we're all guilty of it. I am as well. But that's what really hit me about this book, that passage from Ephesians. Paul was in prison, and he was more concerned about others and their spiritual life than his own physical comfort. Wow. So we, in Deaf Fellowship, we need to make this place and shake it up. Some of you, I think I can say, I think I've said this before. It's a rerun statement, but I'm not a strong prayer warrior. I am not. 
I can preach, I can sign, but I just, I'm still learning. But some of you are champs at this. We need your help. What that looks like, I'm not really sure. Pray for us as a church to grow, but also we need someone to show us how to do it, what we are going to be doing. Get together, pray, not just Bible studies, but pray for the future of the church. We need something. I'm asking God. I'm praying that God will touch each person here who has this strong spiritual gift. Help this church to shake things up to refresh us and realize how powerful prayer can be. And I know prayer is powerful, but I'm just not great at it. Whatever great at it means. So we need you. Please listen to your heart. All of us, watch out. Keep your eyes open because the Holy Spirit will be nudging each of us. And Peter will coming back and be coming back in September and he does he will see the same church. Yeah, shake it up. <laughs> and then I train Peter. <laughs> but anyway, Father, we just thank you for those who shared. Father, thank you for this church family. We thank you for your love, for your power putting each person here, having them come together. And I thank you for leading me here. Now it's been 12 years, I think it was 12 years ago. We've been through a lot, but I have grown to know more about you through this church. And I pray that others will also grow and know more and recognize that you are an awesome God and you have given us life through Jesus Christ as we are all sinners. And we pray and lift up each person here because you pay attention to our prayers and you want as Paul wrote in Ephesians you want that for us too so help us to open our hearts and our minds and let those roots grow through the Holy Spirit and it's in Jesus precious name we pray amen father we thank you for this glorious day you came to earth, you saved us, you changed us. You taught us and showed us how to live when you were living on earth and still you're alive today. Thank you for continually working within our lives and showing each one of us all the things that happened this morning. We still can see that you were in control always. And we thank you, Jesus, for this time together. We ask that you help all of us open our hearts and our minds and be ready to see what you have in your word. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.